All right, we're going to uh, pick up where we left off last time on PHP. Um, sort of the, um, to summarize last time's uh, lecture, PHP is again a server-side uh, scripting technology. As such, it is not responsible, like JavaScript is, for manipulating an existing web page. That's JavaScript's job. That runs in the browser and manipulates a web page that exists. Uh, PHP is used to actually in the act of creating a web page. Um, a PHP script will consist of just plain old stuff that the browser understands. That is um, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, stuff that browser understands. But then it has inside of it possibly some PHP code which gives the script the ability to do a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff dynamic. Um, most typically what it will do is it will do something with the form data that it's given. All right? And that's sort of where we started off uh, last time, simply by taking form data from the, um, uh, that's submitted from a form and uh, processing it. Um, let's review that example. Let's review the stuff in it. And we have two pages here. And, and it's, it's a little mini quiz, and it doesn't even do anything yet as far as grading the quiz. It just spits out the answer. So whatever I type in for the answer, when I click Submit, it sends it to a page, and, and it knows the answer. So we've made it from page one to page two. And that may not seem like a big deal. Again, um, those of you that may have done a lot of desktop programming may say, so what? All right. But in the web environment, remember that every request made um, is a standalone request. Uh, there's nothing in the protocol that ties requests together. Therefore, the server and the pages have to remember some stuff and have to be able to pass up stuff from one page to another. And the one way that we pass stuff is via what's called the query string. So if you notice on the end of this um, URL, we have the values from the form. So let's look at the form. Let's look at the PHP script that processes it, and then let's look at the URL. The form is plain old HTML. There is no dynamic scripting. There is no PHP script in the form. And that's just fine, right? Remember, a PHP file can contain HTML and CSS and JavaScript, but it also can contain uh, the scripting stuff in PHP that gets executed on the server side. Notice again, with the form, we have a couple attributes that when we were doing JavaScript stuff or when we first studied forms in CISS 216, these might not have been that important. All right? But now they become critical because this is what calls the script that's going to process the data from this form. And these two attributes on the form tag are number one, the action. All right? which is the name of the script that's going to be processing this. In this case, the name of the script is quiz dot, or quiz2.php. And the second thing is the method, which is either get or post. Um, probably for most of the examples, I will use the get function because that passes on the query string. If you're passing real sensitive data, you might want to use a post, all right? Like, so you don't expose on a URL a password or, or something like that. By passing it on the query string, I mean this. The URL, this part is what comes from the action. That corresponds to an action of quiz2.php. Because we use the get method, the data is going to be passed on the query string. And the query string comes after the name of the script. And it consists of all of the form elements on that page that have a name and have a value. So there's something called answer. There's something called btn submit. So as if we notice, if we look at the query string, answer has the value of 222 because that's what I typed in. All right. btn submit has a value of grade because that's the value of that button, all right? We've given the button a value. By seeing btn submit equals grade, that tells me that that button got pressed. 
All right. If that button wasn't pressed, for example, if I had a second submit button on this page, you know, btn submit two, then btn submit would not have a value on the query string. btn submit two would have a value. Questions up till this point. Notice one thing. Just looking at the query string, do we know for sure what those form fields were? Do I know that answer is a text box? Do I know BTN is a submit button other than the fact that I prefixed it with BTN? That's a clue, but let's imagine I didn't prefix it with BTN and I just said submit or something like that. Can you tell from looking at that 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 comes from a text box? No. All right. You're simply passing, when you pass form data, you're simply passing pairs of name of the form field and the value. And really, in, in one respect, that's good because we could conceivably really easy change this quiz from a short answer quiz where you type in the number to a multiple choice where we supplied two or three options and let the user pick. In fact, towards the end of class, we'll probably do that today. All right, we'll change that to a drop down. And we won't have to change our script. As long as we keep the field named answer, that script knows that the data is coming in answer. All right. The reason for that, again, is, as I said before, in um, in PHP, in the server-side scripting, you're not dealing with an existing web page. You're dealing with requests and responses. Those are the objects. In every server-side scripting language, there's typically a request object and a response object. And there is in, in .NET, you know, if, if you're doing that, in IIS, there is in PHP. If you study any other server-side scripting language, it's that way uh, as well. The request object contains stuff the browser is sending to the server. So all the form stuff that's coming in is part of the request object. All right. The response is what the server is sending back to the client. All right. So the response is what the server sends back to the to the client. All right. So always keep that in mind that. This isn't dealing with the DOM. This isn't dealing with the world of drop downs and options and, and IDs and, and stuff like that. It's dealing with request and response objects. And the most critical thing about the request object is going to be the um, form data in most cases or in many cases anyhow. All right. There's a lot of other stuff as part of the request object though. There is, for example, uh, information about who is requesting the page. And, and by who, I don't necessarily mean the person, but the platform that's requesting the page. All right. That has implications if you're dealing with a mobile website. Right? If you noticed, a lot of times if you go on your phone or smartphone or whatever, and let's say you typed in CNN.com, it'll actually redirect you to M.CNN.com. And a lot of pages do that. The M standing for mobile. All right. How is it able to do that? It's able to do that because it's able to query the request object to see the platform that you're coming in on. And based on that platform, it directs you one place or another. All right. So that's all part of the request object. So there's a mess of stuff that's part of the request object. Um, the main thing that we're interested in now is the form data. So how is that form data processed? Well, again, here's the page that eventually is going to grade the quiz. Right now all it's doing is grabbing the answer and displaying the answer. All right. This is another way of saying find the thing on the query string or rather give me the value of the thing on the query string that has a name of answer. So that dollar sign underscore get means find this on the query string. What on the query string? The thing that has answer. That will be no different for getting the data from a text box or a radio button or a drop down or whatever. All right, Because this doesn't know that it came from a drop down 
all it has is the name of a field and a value. And we're taking that value off the query string and putting it in a variable called name. All right? Variables in PHP start with a dollar sign. PHP is also very much case sensitive, just as JavaScript is. So if I were to not spell get with capital G-E-T, or if I were to capitalize and in name, then dollar sign name is a totally different variable. Now, uh, it's also a lot, a, a little pickier than JavaScript as far as ending your sentences or ending your statements with a semicolon. In JavaScript, you can kind of cheat and get away with not having it, even though you should have it. Whereas in PHP, it's going to gripe if you don't have it at the end. The print statements, what the print statement says is output this to the client. Make this part of the response in, in technical terms. All right. So what I'm doing is in the middle of that, I am outputting the response of whatever value it's in. Now I can output an HTML tag. Right? I could do something like this. Print h1 I believe you use a ampersand in PHP. We'll see how well my memory is. <coughs> yep. I broke something now. Well, we'll leave that for later. There's actually a neat trick that we can do that looks like this. Now's as good a time as any to do that. Quotes in PHP work a little different than quotes in other programming languages. Double quotes are what are called magic quotes. All right? That kind of sounds fun, but they're magic quotes. What do magic quotes do? they automatically drop in the values of variables in there. So, in other words, whereas something in JavaScript, you'd have to do something like concatenate, like I was trying to do, all right, and it didn't work. Um, in PHP, all you need to do is put the variable in the middle of the quotes with everything else, provided that they're double quotes. So, let's try that now. And there I get 222. I don't know why the other one didn't work before. I didn't have uh, the concatenation right, apparently, for that. So if I do it in single quotes, what am I going to get? I'm going to get an H1 tag that has the word dollar sign name in there. Because single quotes aren't magic. All right? Double quotes are magic. So double quotes, wherever there is a variable, uh, drops in the value of that variable. And that, that's part of the reason why variables start with a dollar sign. So to distinguish that from uh, just the word name. If I wanted to put, if it was called name, then it would be confusing. Do I want the word name or do I want the value? Whereas starting all the variables with dollar sign, you know, you, you get around that issue. Let's change this to use the post method, because we should do at least one example using the post method. All right, so I'm going to change the action from get to post. And I'm going to change this from dollar sign get to dollar sign post. Other than that, it should work the same. All right, let me refresh that. I can put in five and click grade, and it outputs it. The only visible difference is, notice that it's not on the query string. The values are not on the query string, because I use the post method. So if you're passing some sort of sensitive 
uh, uh, data on there. Now, the other thing that putting it on the query string is good for is you can actually construct a link. All right. Let's go to MapQuest. And let's put this in. And let's try to find our college on MapQuest. It's my daughter's name, so I spelled it wrong. Plus, I was listening to George Harrison today. So, a combination of those two things. Uh, by the way, the, yeah, the HBO documentary tonight on the life of George Harrison, for anyone that has HBO. Martin Scorsese directing it. I'm really looking forward to that. Unfortunately, I, let's see, I can't do it in this case. Um, uh, let's see. Let's try this. All right. Notice that Google passed on the query string that. Guess what I could do? I could build a web page that said a href equals construct that giant query string And if I click on that, I get the results about PHP. And they sort of do that on purpose, right? Because they want you to use their services. So if they allow that query string public, then you can actually create links to that. And that's what MapQuest used to do and Google Maps used to do. I think they may have changed that since then for whatever reason. I'm not really sure. Uh, but at any rate, um, that can allow you to put links on your page so that they can get to this without having to submit a form. You know, if I were doing a, uh, a page as resources for uh, students about PHP and JavaScript and all that, I could do that query, then go and put that link on the page, and, it, and that would save the students the trouble of going to Google and typing it. They'd just click on it and get that list. So if I use the query string, I can do that. Um, I'll give you an example, um, real life example. Um, we may, on, on applications I've worked on, we've done this. We've had a drop down that says choose category. And maybe in that drop down there would be, you know, Rings, watches, earrings, you know, for a jewelry store, and so on. And then there'll be a submit button. That will submit to a page that will grab that off of the query string and do a query and show all the items for that particular category. I may also have navigation links for rings, watches, earrings over here to sort of give two ways of navigating to that page. And guess what? The link that I create here will have the same query string as though they clicked and submitted the form. So it's just a nice way to be able to get a little more flexibility in doing that. You can't get that with the post. Now, you might want to keep people from doing that, all right, with your page. So you would use a post. Or you may be passing sensitive data or whatever. So you would, you would use a post. Um, at any rate, getting back to this, the only really visible difference that we had between the two is that in the second example, we can't see the data on the query string. All right, we just, but it did get there, right, because the, that is displaying it. All right. Now, one thing that you can do 
is instead of dollar sign get, dollar sign post, there's sort of a, a catch-all, and that is to grab that value straight from the request object. And that will work whether you do a post or a get. So that's a little more flexible. So with request, I don't have to change the PHP code if I change the method. Get rid of this link. Now if I go in and change it back to a method of get, I won't have to change my PHP code. So usually just for flexibility I use the request option. So it doesn't have to be capitalized there, but it does in the text. Yes. Yeah. They're, they're different things. Remember that the, the script on the other, you know, the, uh, the, the form tag and the word get there, that's an HTML tag, so it's subject to the rules of HTML. And the rules of HTML would say that get and post are lowercase, all right, if you went and validated that, all right. This form could submit to anything, right? It could submit to a server-side scripting language that I wrote. It could submit to ASP.NET. It could submit to PHP or Perl or Ruby or any number of different languages. That's why there's really no correspondence to that. That tag is following the rules of HTML. The server-side scripting language will follow its own rules. And its own rules typically, and again, what distinguishes it is typically sort of those built-in variables start with uh, uh, uppercase. Um, start with an underscore in our uppercase. So I can go and save that and now it's using a get. I can see it on the query string and it's still working. So that just gives me a little more flexibility. All right. Now, let's actually grade this quiz. All right, let's actually go in and, and grade the quiz. And let's tell the person if they got it right or not. And we'll start out simply by hard coding the value, right? That's, that's the easiest way to do it. Now, there's good news and there's bad news as far as the syntax of PHP, all right? Or let's put it this way, there's always a catch, right? There's good news as far as the syntax of PHP, but there's a couple catches, all right? First of all, the syntax of PHP is very similar to JavaScript, all right? That's the good news. In this class, anyhow, you won't have the confusion of switching between VB-like syntax and PHP-like syntax. PHP and VB are both based on this ECMA standard or something like that, I don't know. But so in other words, you use the braces to indicate a block of code, all right? Um, that sort of thing. Case sensitive, uh, that sort of thing. So that's the good news. The catches are, number one, is, um, you know, you don't have tons of JavaScript experience. So you're still working through understanding the JavaScript ex uh, uh, syntax. So I guess this is good because it'll reinforce it. And the other catch is, is very similar, but it's not identical. There's a couple of quirks that are a little bit different uh, between JavaScript and PHP. Uh, the one quirk we've already seen, namely that um, all variables are preceded by a dollar sign. All right. So with that in mind, let's go in and let's put an if statement in here to tell the user if they're right or wrong. Now I'm going to do this a couple different ways. Um, we'll do it one way first, all right, and you won't be allowed to see that way, no. We'll do it one way first, all right, and then we'll go in and we'll do it a second way, all right. 
And which way you do it is really a matter of style. All right, just what you prefer. All right. And what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to put my if statement. Starts with the word if. <coughs> dollar sign name equals to. So far it looks very similar to JavaScript, right? Else. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in a print to say one paragraph that says your answer was, use the magic quotes. The magic quotes are one other example of, of a quirk in PHP. You don't get magic quotes in JavaScript. And I'll close this paragraph tag. Then I'll print another paragraph that says your answer is right. <coughs> Otherwise, we'll say your answer is wrong. Now, just for giggles, Let's throw some style in here. Because we talked about PHP writing HTML. PHP can actually write, that is send to the browser, any code that the browser gets, right? So it can write HTML. We've seen examples of that. It can also write CSS stuff if we want. Or it could write JavaScript stuff. So let's kind of get into that. So um, I'll put a style. And I'll put a different style if it is right versus wrong. Well, that's good enough. So I'm going to include in that class equals, and I will put either right or wrong. Let's make sure this works. So if I put in 3, my answer is wrong. If I put in 2, your answer is right. Okay. So again, the basics of the if statement are the same from JavaScript, right? If, in parentheses, you have a condition, you then have a, in, in braces, you have a block of statements that get executed if the condition is true, else another set of braces, a block of, con, uh, of statements that you do if the condition was false. Optionally, you don't need this in all cases. You don't have to have an else statement, but again, oftentimes you do. Same use of the double equal sign, all right? So that's, that's a good thing, all right? And we're able to output different HTML with different CSS classes attached to it. Now, <clears throat> this is, in this mode, what I did is I went into PHP mode, I wrote all my dynamic HTML, and then I popped out of PHP mode, all right? There's an alternative way that we could do this. And one way isn't superior to 
the other. The other way is I could pop in and out of PHP as needed. So, I could sort of do this. I could sort of do all my calculations at the beginning of the script. We'll say name 2 equals that. I could say, well, we'll leave it, we'll leave it like that. Then I could do this. In the middle of that PHP sta uh, statement, I, or I'm sorry, in the middle of that HTML statement, I could pop in the PHP and print the value of name. And then close my paragraph tag. I then could go create a second paragraph your answer is all right and right smack dab into that paragraph pop in the PHP mode if dollar sign name to equals to print right else print wrong pop out of PHP mode and then close my paragraph tag. Let's make sure this works and I don't have any typos before I go ahead. All right, looks like it works. Let's put in a wrong answer. It does, it more or less works. The only thing I didn't do was the style. Now, how do I want to put this? Which way you do it, I don't care. All right, I don't care which way you do it. Start to sound like Yoda there for a minute. All right, but I don't care which way you do it. All right. One could make the argument that this is slightly more efficient because the server, as it's parsing through this file, goes into PHP mode, stays there, and then comes out. Whereas this one is sort of popping back and forth between that. I don't know if that really matters. Uh, if it does, it's the tiniest factor. It's not that important. Suffice it to say that sometimes when you're coding, one way will look like the right way to do it. In a different situation, the other way might, uh, might be the right way to do it. So you can either output, and the difference between these two is you can either output your entire piece of HTML, or you can have a mix of HTML that's just a plain old tag with a PHP instruction smack dab in the middle of it. Six of one, half does the other, doesn't matter. Both gets the same results. I don't care which way to do it. Do which way makes sense to you. I do introduce this to you, again, because if you look at examples, you're liable to see examples done either way. So you should at least, even if you have a preferred way of doing it, you should at least be familiar with the other way, so if you see an example. Now, what about the style? Well, I can write in the middle of this P tag. I can pop into PHP mode. And 
and put code in there that says if name equals two, print. I'm going to print the name of the class, which is uh, class equals, right? Right, okay. Otherwise, class equals wrong. I think that's correct. Let's run it and find out. And sure enough, it is. Now, a couple things to keep in mind. A key thing to do when you're debugging, if things don't turn out the way that you expect them to, you're liable to get a syntax error, and, and if you get that, then you debug that way. But even though you get, um, you know, even though you um, don't get a syntax error, what if I forgot to put the word class in there, which I almost did? All right, I almost did that. Let's pretend that I did. Oh, that doesn't work. Oftentimes better than staring at the code and trying to figure out is look at the source that got generated. Look at the output of that PHP and a lot of times it'll jump out right at you. Oh, P wrong, that's not correct. All right, it should be P class equals wrong. So you have to go back then and change your script. So again, that's... Um, I can do one better. I can put the quotes in HTML and put my PHP call right in the middle of that. All right, and again, it works. If I look at the source that it generates, generate a few extra spaces in there, but effectively it works. Now, I hesitate to, to use the word beautiful and ugly when it comes to code, all right? But I don't think any other word describes this. This can get to be ugly code, all right? This is getting to be what in the old days was called spaghetti code, where it's just a tangle of stuff that gets all tangled together. That is one big difference for those of you that have come and maybe have done some programming on the .NET platform. All right? The .NET platform sort of gives you a framework that's a starting point, and it nudges you in the right direction. All right? It nudges you, it pushes you in the right direction. That being said, right, you can still mess it up. You, know, you can write ugly code in any programming language. It's your constitutional right to write ugly code in any language you want. All right, no one's going to take, no one can take that right away from you no matter how hard they try. But the .NET framework pushes you or nudges you in the right direction to write good code, right? Because you have the ASPX and the ASPX VB file and you have functions and you have, you have uh, uh, controls that you can drop on your page. There's a lot of nudging you in the right direction. PHP is really, it can be a free-for-all. So you could write good code in PHP, you can write bad code in PHP. You're not pushed one way or another, therefore it's up to your discipline and practices to make sure that you write code that's good. And we'll talk a little bit about some things that we can do. This is a very simple example, all right? And already that code's starting to look kind of ugly, all right, in this case. You could imagine if there were you know, a hundred questions on this quiz, what it would look like, or if there was more complicated stuff being done, if we put a smiley face next to the right answer or the wrong answer, uh, a frowny face, you know, how that would add to the complexity of this and how it would add to ugliness of code. So do be aware of that, all right? Um, and we'll talk about some things that you can do, but, but it's sort of on you, all right? You're not really given any good direction uh, the, the tool allows you to do what you want, all right? Um, 
one thing I said we were going to do, and now is a good time to do it, is let's change the answer from a text box to a drop down. All right, so let's get rid of that, and let's put a drop down. I'm going to put name equals, all right, name equals, and remember, what's the script expecting the answer to be in? The server-side script? The server-side script is expecting the answer to be somewhere in the request object, either the query string or posted with the, with the HTTP request in a field called answer. So I better call that field when I make it a drop down. I better still keep it as answer. But the fact that it's now a drop down instead of a text box doesn't have any bearing on anything. I'm deliberately writing out the, the numbers so that we can see the difference between what the user sees and what the script sees. We've already seen this in JavaScript. We're, we're going to see it in, in PHP as well. And that is the script is going to see the value, not what the user sees. So if I pick 4 and click grade, notice what got passed on the query string is the numeric value of 4. All right, not the word 4. And I output that and it tells me it's wrong. If I go in and make the right choice, it knows it and it tells me it's correct. So it really doesn't matter where the data is coming from. All right. That's like the example I gave before, how you could actually make a link that's passing those things on the query string and it would still work. All right? That script is simply expecting something on the query string that has a name of something. All right? And that's what it works on. Let's go and add a dummy value to this. value equals nothing, please choose answer. So now we have that. And if they don't pick an answer, Nothing's passed on a query string. There's an empty string there. And of course they got it wrong. Well, I don't know. That might, that might be how you grade a quiz. But the other thing I might want to do is I might want to validate it to make sure they've made at least some choice. I might not want to let them get by without making a, a choice. All right? Let's say I do. Now, where could I put validation? I could put validation both client side and server side. And in fact, I'm going to want to do that and put validation client side and server side. Why? All right. In this particular case, the real reason why is because client side scripting could be disabled. All right. They could, the user in their browser could uh, disable client side scripting, in which case um, they'd be able to submit a form that didn't have uh, the field filled in. And assuming we want to prevent that from happening, there would be no way to, for us to prevent it from happening if all we had was client-side validation and um, that was disabled. So we're going to put redundant validation in this case. We're going to put validation in um, 
the server side as well. Think of this as, as you know, like wearing a belt and a pair of suspenders at the same time, right? You're, you're covered either way, all right? Uh, and so that's what we're going to do, all right? Let's go and first do client side. We'll see if we can get through this whole example. If not, um, I don't know what we'll do. I don't know if we'll stop or, yeah, we'll probably continue. Script, put my script tag here. I'm going to put my end script here. I'm going to put my function to validate form. And then I'm going to say something like this, if. This is where putting an ID and a name on is going to come in handy because I can use then either way of referring to it. If document get element by ID answer equals nothing. I'm going to do something I vowed I would not do in this class, and as I'm going to put an alert box up there, all right, we'll, we'll, in the interest of time. Now, watch what I'm going to do. This validate form, I want to return to someone whether the form validated or not, right? Because I want to do one of two things. I either want to continue and submit the data to that second script for processing, or I want to bail out and you know, not, uh, not continue onto that second page because the data is invalid. So I'm going to return that be valid. There's one other thing I have to change I omitted. I'm going to set be valid equal to false here. So this function is going to now return a true or false. True indicates that the form did validate. False indicates the form didn't validate. Now, where am I going to call this? I could call this on the on click event. The better place to call it is on the on submit event of the form. The reason for that is there's potentially or there could be potentially multiple ways to submit this form. You might have two buttons on there. You might, there's a lot of ways that you could do this. And we want to want this validation of fire no matter how they've submitted it. So I'm going to say on submit equals return validate form. So this is similar to what we did except I threw in the word return. What does that mean and what's the impact of that? Well, follow the logic here. When this form is submitted, this function gets called to validate the form. The function runs. It does its thing. When it's done, it returns the be valid variable. That variable is either true or false. All right? That variable gets sent back to here. And that value gets returned to the onSubmit event. Okay? Now, the onSubmit event gets a true or a false. True for the onSubmit event means, yep, you're okay. Go ahead and continue and submit. False for your onSubmit event says, wait a minute, there's a problem here. Bail out. Don't submit. So, when you return a value to an event like that, you're telling it either to continue if it's true 
or stop if it's false. And anytime you return a false to an event, that stops the event from happening. You know, so you could, you could have returns on any sort of JavaScript function. It makes most sense for the validation function. So, let's see what I mean in this example. So let's go here. Please choose answer. Ooh. Something's wrong. And submit return validate form. Validate form. If document. Pardon me? Yeah, I know. Why? Well, that that's the problem. Why is it going in and continuing? Let's run this in Firefox because Firefox gives me better JavaScript errors. matter. Oh. Yeah, it's not giving me an error. Form method equals that on submit equals return validate form equals Oh, huh. Value. You guys are going to need to do a much better job because throughout the rest of the semester, I'm going to be making little errors like that. <laughs> All right? Just to, keep Just to keep you on your toes and practice your JavaScript. So don't let it happen again. All right. Now, must choose an option, doesn't submit. You choose an option, it goes and submits it. This is where we'll leave off for today. What we'll do next time is we'll look at how we're going to write some code on the server side to do the similar thing in case the server side, I'm sorry, in case the client side uh, validation was disabled, uh, we'd still want to validate it on the server side. In this case, we're just going to be doing redundant validation. In other cases, we may actually do more extensive validation if we were hitting up against a database, for example, to see if the data was valid in the database. All right? So this is where we'll leave off here. Um, we'll continue uh, on Monday.